We are Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Derek Lambert here, your host. You're going to want to check out this show. This is going to be exciting, ladies and gentlemen. Go down in that description. Check out everything. We're, I'm going to introduce our guest here in just a second, but I have another GoFundMe because it is one of my interest to want to talk about this topic called full preterism. And Dr. Carrier would be willing to debate a man who helped lead me into what is called full preterism. And I'm not going to go into all that other than the fact that they believe that the New Testament and this uh, idea of prophecy actually happened and the story is over and it actually was fulfilled. Whereas critical scholars say failed prophecy. So hmm, what happened? Also, I want to give you guys an announcement real quick here at the beginning. And I know we don't have a lot of people in yet, so it takes a little time for people to trickle in. So hopefully people can watch this and turn back. One of the things I plan to do, and I've been in contact with Dr. Carrier, is I'd like to fly to Cali. I'd like to go and stay a couple nights in a hotel, bring all my camera gear, and record him in person the same way I recorded with Dr. Price. Try and get 60 to 100 questions asked by the audience and record it in person, edit it down, and put it on the channel. So if you guys are looking for Dr. Carrier material and you want to hear what he has to bring to the table, you guys, I'll set up a GoFundMe. You can help get that to make that possible so I can fly out, meet him, record him, make him hate me by the time I leave in a couple days, exhaust the hell out of him, and you guys will have a lot of Dr. Carrier material. So uh, I'll make that something that'll be possible here soon. You guys will see it on Myth Vision Podcast and on the Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, make sure you go join. Also in the description here, we have Jason Folks joining us. He has a podcast called Dragons in Genesis. And I've had a few phone calls with this gentleman here, and they were very interesting. You're going to like this show. Go ahead and hit that like button, ladies and gentlemen. Leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think as the show goes on. Share this information out there. Welcome to the show, Jason. It's good to be here, man. I've uh, I've, I've spent hours uh, watching your stuff, so uh, I already feel like I'm at home. So <laughs> I think you are in your home, though, like literally, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so... Jason, what do you do? Tell our audience, man. Get us hyped. Get us get us excited on what it is. I mean, were you a Christian and then a boom, some crap happened? Like, what what's going on, brother? Yeah, so uh, my deconversion story is quite long. I'm actually going to be going on uh, Neil the 604 Atheist show uh, next month to talk all about the whole big deconversion story because that's what his whole channel is. Um, so I'm not going to bog you all down with it. But um, the the short version is I was raised Catholic. I was quite devout. I was really active in the church, co-founder of the youth group, mentor program. I was being trained uh, to become a catechism teacher. And I had some questions. So we had this book. It's called The Catholic Catechism. It's like that thick. It, it's as thick as the Bible. And it's right. all about Catholic doctrine because a lot of Catholic doctrine does not come from the Bible. And I read the whole thing, and it still didn't answer my questions. So I went to the priest, and that didn't answer my questions. So I did the thing that most Catholics don't do. And this is not a disparaging remark against Catholics. It's just most doctrine doesn't come from the Bible. So I did the thing that Catholics don't do. I read the Bible. <laughs> By the time I got to Genesis 7, the, the Noah's flood story, I encountered this thing, uh, which this is an amazing thing about Catholic Bibles. There's a ton of footnotes. And in there, it says that the, the, the Noah's flood story comes from multiple sources. And so I'm reading this and I'm like, wait, what do you mean multiple sources? It's one story. And so it, it actually tells which verses come from which sources. So I get a pen and I start highlighting these passages. First time I'd ever done something like this on my own. It was always like a guided Bible study. So I do this on my own. I highlight all the passages from one source, and then I leave all the other passages unhighlighted. And then I go back and I read chapter seven again. This time I read all the highlighted passages, and then I read all the rest. And it's like a light went off. I could, there, there were, these were two stories. You know, the Noah's flood, it was two different flood stories that had been jammed together. 
And suddenly I had more questions that no one could answer. I finished reading the Bible. By the time I was done, I was no longer a believer. I had come to the conclusion that this was a book of mythology. But I still had these questions. So I started reading about the Bible. And the more I read and the more I understood, the more questions I had. Fast forward about 10 years, I get the bright idea for some stupid reason to start a podcast, just <laughs> telling people all the stuff I've learned. Right. I'm really fascinated with mythology. I love the idea of this, these stories continually evolving over hundreds or even thousands of years and becoming something entirely different, uh, being deliberately changed so they can be used for different purposes by different groups. And so the more I read, the more I learn, the more I'm fascinated by it. And the more I fall in love with this book that I had never truly read as a Christian. And um, so you get to where I am today. I have a podcast that is focused on, um, it's sort of a secular Bible study and comparative mythology podcast. That, that's probably the best way to describe it. Uh, I go through the entire Bible. I don't like go to like uh, the creation story and then jump to Noah's flood. No, I talk about the boring stuff in between, which, you know, probably makes you not want to listen to the show. Um, but I, I go through all of it. Um, I, I kind of gloss over a lot of the begats, you know, because, well, you don't need to hear the whole thing. But <laughs> if there's a story in there, I cover it. And if it's based on an older story, I tell you about that. And um, and that's that's what the podcast is. Um, it's it's not really about religion. It's about the stories behind the stories. And I even get into some of the other uh, some of the other texts that aren't in the Bible, uh, such as Enoch, uh, having a lot of fun with Enoch right now. And uh, I get into uh, some of these broader topics like the transition of theology between uh, the first temple and second temple Judaism, uh, the massive shift to have a, a mini series that, I believe was done early last year, uh, all about that topic. And it starts off with like, you know, a good reconstruction of first temple theology, you know, some of the practices and things like that. And then these external influ and internal influences that changed it. And then, you know, how it was affected by that. So moving into second temple and then also what happened with those leftover adherents to first temple theology. Uh, so I'll get into stuff like that too. Uh, interesting. Interesting. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's basically who I am. And the reason I say it's unfortunate that I started a podcast. Um, I hate talking to people. I hate the sound of my own voice. Um, I'm not a believer, so I don't know why I'm stuck on the Bible. Uh, so yeah, I, you, you might have a lot in common with me. I mean, in, yeah. in a lot of ways, I, I love, I'm fascinated with this topic. And uh, I mean, you can ask me why, and I can give you five reasons, but many reasons might be why that I haven't mentioned. And so um, I just think it's such an interesting historical book. And when I say historical, I don't mean I'm saying the essence of it in there are all historical. Uh, this is history. And mm -hmm. it has a super uh, or an enormous effect on people in this world still to this day. So when my entire family are all within Christianity and I found myself outside, but just as loving and kind as they are, um, they they're like, what? Why would you be into this? You're more into this than we are. And we say we're Christians. Why are you into this more? I've, so, yeah, it's, that. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of strange. I do enjoy this. Uh, so you're going to bring. And, and man, let me just say this to our audience. We're going to have to do more shows. So I, I want to let everyone know I, you live three, three and a half hours from me in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm, I'm in Fayetteville, North Carolina, near Fort Bragg. We're going to meet up. I'm going to be recording you like I did Dr. Price. We're going to get in person. I'm going to do some cameras. So after the show, anyone watching this, you're going to know Jason folks, and you're going to want to ask him some questions or give him some ideas because we're going to do in-person recordings. And even if you didn't have any questions, he has plenty to talk about. So, <laughs> all right, Enoch, who is this guy? 
what is going on? Dr. Price said, and I'll just throw this out there, and I didn't know this till recently, and I don't even know if I've launched this podcast of Dr. Price yet. I've got like 20 or 30 videos still left in my chamber of recordings that happened within the past couple of weeks that Dr. Price is on material that are questions from our audience. But oh, one of the things wait. he said, I know, right? One of the things he said was Enoch, Moses, which is like a what? Hold on, what? And Elijah, all three never really died. There are sources that even give the indication that God took Moses away. Like, mm. And then some say, oh, he was dead, but they don't know where he was buried, all this kind of stuff. So there were the three figures, so to speak, that are not dead in the narrative. And mm. strangely enough, if you go to Revelation, and I know I'm skipping ahead, but the two witnesses that appear are sometimes, he said, Enoch and Moses, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's uh, Elijah and Moses. But right. I found it fascinating on the Mount of Transfiguration. There's Jesus with Elijah and Moses. And Dr. Price said a lot of scholars believe that this story, this clip, this little soundbite on the mountain is actually a post-resurrection narrative that doesn't belong where it does in Matthew 17, but rather it should be toward the end. So mm -hmm. whoever compiled these into this book, this is actually a post-resurrection resurrection scene where really it's showing you they're all three still alive like right. that kind of indication so anyway um i don't know throwing that out there for our audience what is enoch who is enoch what the heck's going on my brother man so that is a major topic i don't think we have enough time to talk about it i have <laughs> i think five episodes already just on enoch and i'm still not done with him um it, it, it was meant to be a quick little detour away from the Bible because I was getting burnt out on uh, First and Second Samuel. I was going to take a quick detour of like maybe two episodes and talk about Enoch and then go into Kings. And that's pretty much been all of this year talking about Enoch. Um, so Enoch is in some ways very similar to Moses. Uh, there's actually uh, oh, there, there's actually a fourth character that wasn't in that list. And he's probably the most mysterious of all because we have the least written about him. And that's the character Melchizedek. Mm. Uh, and they all, they all have this really weird, they're, they're part of this really weird theology. And it's almost like they're taking this, this archetypal character and dropping them into the narrative at different points. So it may actually be better to understand parts of Moses. Most of Moses is part of the pseudo history, but, parts of Moses, like when he goes up onto the mountain to receive the covenant and to learn how to build the temple, uh, and he goes into the cloud um, and possibly goes back in time to witness the six-day creation story, um, and I can get into that in a minute, um, and then the mythology behind the Elijah story, uh, some of the mentions of Melchizedek and the whole thing with Enoch, it may be better to understand him as actually just being one character that was kind of just repackaged. Uh, but Enoch is this very fascinating character. He pops up like once in the Bible. Um, it's right after the whole Adam and Eve story, Cain and Abel. You have a bunch of begats, you know, and then they get into Noah. Well, in there, you, you have this character named Enoch, and it's talking about who lived how many years, and then they died, and then this guy lived like 800 years, then he died. And then there was a guy named Enoch. He lived 365 years, which red flag right there. Yeah. That's an allusion to a solar calendar. And then he went up into the sky and walked with God. And then it just moves on and it doesn't talk about this guy who just ascended bodily into heaven while everyone else on earth died. And it's like, what is going on here? Who is this? And why aren't you saying anything else about him? This is important. It's kind of like the in Genesis 6, where it talks about the Nephilim, you know, the, the sons of God came down to earth and they had sex with human women. And there was this race of giants. And then Yahweh decided to flood the earth. Now let's move on. What's the rest of the story? Well, luckily, we have this giant thing called the book of Enoch that tells us the rest of the story. And so we have this character who is a sort of intermediary between heaven and earth, uh, very similar to how we picture Jesus in the first century. You know, 
he can talk directly to God, but at the same time, he is of earth and, you know, he will eventually um, go up into heaven. He will preside over the end times, judge the living and the dead. Uh, he gets to read the tablets of life and all this other stuff. Well, a lot of that stuff about Jesus was written several hundred years earlier in the book of Enoch. Enoch is this archetypal intermediary. He, he was born on earth, but he goes up into heaven bodily. He become, he actually, uh, at the end of the book of parables, which is the second section of one Enoch, he actually, his flesh melts off, you know, like the Nazis in uh, the Indiana Jones movie, and he becomes an angel. He, he actually transforms into a celestial being. He becomes an angel, uh, and this all happens up, up in the heavens. And when this happens, he is then revealed, uh, I think it's Gabriel, but don't quote me on that. One of the archangels then flat out says, you are the son of man. And so Enoch actually transforms into an angel, into a son of God. And is then given the title, the son of man. But during his whole existence, um, he does a lot of different things. Like he prepares all the knowledge and wisdom and everything of the world and of the heavens. A lot of secret knowledge. There's a lot of references to uh, like mystery cult ideas in the book of Enoch. But he takes all this knowledge and he writes it down. And he passes it on to Methuselah so that he can give it to Noah so it can all be preserved on Noah's Ark so that after the world is destroyed and they can go in and like rebuild, you know, civilization and everything, all of this divine knowledge won't be lost. And that, that's supposed to be the origin story of the Book of Enoch. Um, so, yeah, you know, which is pretty <laughs> typical. You know, they, they, like, they like taking these, these old, you know, these old things and pretending they're really old and right. then saying that they were written by some famous guy, you know, uh, Moses wrote the Torah, you know, Mark wrote the first gospel, um, stuff like that. But yeah. yeah so it's this, this fascinating it, character. That's what I was going to say. The book of Enoch isn't in the canon that we have currently. Do you have any reasons why? Well, it is in the canon. In the Ethiopian canon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's funny because like canon just means that this group liked it, but right. non-canonical means God. this other group didn't. Um, I mean, the the Bible I grew up on has seven books that the Protestants have never heard of. Um, I'll be mm -hmm. like talking about a story, you know, from the Bible and my girlfriend's like, that's not in there. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, it's in this. But she's like, that book isn't in there. It's like, oh wait, <laughs> different, you know, different groups of Christians, different canon. Um, so yeah, it, it was. Um, it it's not in the. Uh, it's not in most of your Old Testament collections. Uh, the the Orthodox Jews didn't preserve it. Uh, later Christians didn't. Most of them, at least, didn't preserve it. But some sectarian Jews and some small groups of Christians did preserve it because to them it was it was canon it was scripture it was very important and if you start reading the Old Testament after you've read the book of Enoch you understand that to early Christianity Enoch may have been more important than the canonical Old Testament and I'm not I'm not being um, I'm not exaggerating here. When I say that Enoch may be more important to early Christianity than the Old Testament, what I mean, and you, you, can, you can verify this, this is something you can quantify. If you count up all the times that uh, the New Testament makes a direct reference to something in the Old Testament, and you take any five books of the Old Testament and look at how many times they are referenced by New Testament authors. One Enoch is referenced more. Really? I, yes. I yes. saw something I want to say. I, I saw something years ago. I was on my way out of, out of the 
Christian box. But um, I was reading First Enoch, and I was reading what the scholars who translated it had to say about it. And there was like a 50-page PDF that was written on this prior to even getting into the book. And I remember them saying something like, uh, you know, Jude is almost a verbatim book borrowing from Enoch the book mm -hmm. of Jude, which is in our new Testament. And then he goes on to reference, even Jesus references Enoch. And so I start going, well, why the heck wouldn't this be in the collection? If Enoch's mm -hmm. being referenced, even by Jesus, our Lord and savior, right? So this mm -hmm. is like where my head's going. So I started looking and realizing there's a lot of references to this. And I think they gave 50 or 60 examples, not just like, like uh, uh, maybe hint. No, you can tell that this is using something from Enoch, and that's when I went, "Wow!" There's and it's not just in one place in the Old Testament. It's not like you just or in the New Testament. It's not like you just find it in one book. So Enoch has a huge influence on why maybe there's some strange stuff going on in the New Testament. Whereas, like yesterday or uh, day before yesterday, I was asking a gentleman who believes that Paul's within Judaism, mm -hmm. and of course. I need to get like the bigger scholars to come on to, to tackle this topic, to really press them and see how this stands up against certain questions. But I asked about the Lord's supper. Last question I asked, like, why are they eating the flesh, drinking the blood? And it was like, good question. We don't really have a good answer for that right now, but is there some strange stuff in Enoch that, or something that might be in first temple Judaism that might permit something like this. And you said, Margaret Barker last night, we were on the phone. You're like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Margaret Barker touches on this. And so it's like, is this first temple and not second temple? What's going on here? So Enoch. <laughs> yeah, Enoch. Yeah. So, you know, the, you, you have this guy who's saying that Paul is within Judaism. Well, our interpretation of Judaism, you know, we look at the Old Testament, we think Orthodox Judaism, you know, uh, we think rabbis and all that, you know, we think the Torah. Well, no, Paul is not within Judaism. Paul, you know, he's not anti-Jewish. The, there are a couple of passages that were inserted into the writings of Paul to kind of make him anti-Jewish. That's later Christian polemic that was tossed in. It doesn't fit within the writing. And it actually is anachronistic because it references the destruction of the temple at one point. Um, so it was obviously written much later. But Paul is not what we would consider Jewish. And I, I, I think the, the writings of Paul make it quite clear. He's like, oh, yeah, you don't need the Torah for salvation. He repeats that throughout. He's like, there's no point in circumcision. We don't need that. You know, uh, he has all these different things that are just in direct violation of, you know, what we would consider Jewish scripture. But the Old Testament is not the whole of Jewish scripture. It is not representative of every sect of Judaism. It is representative of, well, not one group, but a small portion or a large portion, but not all, but not whole, you know, right. um, a, what would later become a cohesive group, but you have all of these other groups, you know, you have like the Essenes, you have like the Samaritans, you have all these other groups that, weren't too happy with the second temple. Uh, we need you can to see talk about that. To this Before in, we get into uh, Enoch, J Jason, take us into this because you, we've had a phone conversation where there, this is a little bit in the vein, of course, of Enoch, but it's important. Our audience is kind of grabbing this stuff. I thought it was. So I think if it's something interesting that nobody's heard, having you talk about this on the show will give people an angle that they'll go, wow, this guy's thinking in, in a way that I've never heard. The temple, like there are guys, you say, just like Dr. Price has mentioned, there's like a cornerstone block that's keeping the water from coming out of the earth so the earth doesn't flood again. It's like a mythology of the stone to mm -hmm. the Jewish temple. Um, there's more to this than that. And you talk oh, yeah. about the eschatological end and how the temple kept the universe going. Like we say money makes the world go around. The temple and its practices and its cultic practices keep the world going around, according to Israel. So what is going on with that, if you don't mind? Okay. Well, before I jump into that, so the audience okay. doesn't forget, Paul does fit sort of within Judaism, just not Old Testament Judaism. Read the seven letters of Paul, uh, 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Philemon, and Romans. Uh 
the, the other epistles are all forgeries. Throw them in the trash. You don't need them. Read those after you read one Enoch, and you'll understand that Paul does fit within Judaism, just not what you normally think of as Judaism. He fits within sectarian Judaism quite well, actually. Um, I, I, I think the branch of Judaism that Paul is sort of coming from, um, this weird messianic doomsday cult, is connected with one Enoch. And I'm going to be making that quite clear in uh, some upcoming episodes of my show. Let me but, ask yeah. you something before you get oh, into the temple okay. then, because now you got me peaked. Oh, sorry. Right. Yeah. That's a problem. Nope. It's so complicated. It's like a spider you're gonna, web. You're going to have to just bear with me. I'm like a kid in a candy store. Once you say something, I'm like lollipop. So you bring up something interesting. You just mentioned in passing, he fits in this strange view. Do the Dead Sea Scrolls also utilize Enoch? Okay. Enough yes, said. You don't, yes. You don't even yes. have to go too far, but I just wanted to know. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, those people, they believed they were going to turn into angels the way Enoch was. They actually believed, I, I've come to believe they were, that they believed they were in the process of physically transforming into angels to fly up into heaven. And I think Paul actually talks about people doing this. He actually talks about how Christians will become angels. They will become sons of God. That's actually in his letters. And, you know, he's like, you are going to transform. You will um, basically cast off your garments of flesh and put on garments of immortality. This is uh, ascension and resurrection uh, language that's being used. And it's the same phrases you find in the book of Enoch and in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hmm. So, yeah, Enoch, the Qumran community, you know, which produced it or which preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls and the seven letters of Paul. You don't really need to separate them. Put those together. That's your bridge between old school Judaism and Christianity. That that's that's how you reconcile Judaism with Christianity. Because when you look at Christianity, you're like, this isn't Jewish. You're thinking of the wrong group of Jews. They weren't one cohesive group the same way Christians weren't. Mm -hmm. um, I think early Christianity came from a different group of Jews, and these they. They loved Enoch. Um, but yeah, so temple, first temple, second temple. temple. Okay, let's let's get to that because <laughs> it, it's sort of like the framework for all of this because you can't understand Enoch without understanding this sectarian conflict right. that arose because of this transition. So the, the big important thing with Christians, you know, BC to AD, the birth of Christ is the delineation, okay? Once that happened, everything after was different, right? The Jews had the same thing, and that was the Babylonian exile. Uh, 586 BCE, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he takes his army, he crushes Jerusalem, like decimates it, the temple is destroyed, and all the, all the powerful people are rounded up, and they are carted off back to Babylon, and... They're imprisoned. Or not really imprisoned. They're, they're put to work, basically a slave labor. One of the things they're in charge of doing is um, rebuilding the uh, the ziggurat to Marduk. And this is where your Tower of Babel story comes from. They get to this place where they have like a dozen different languages, most of which aren't Semitic. Um, and all these people are building this giant, you know, temple complex, far larger than anything they've ever seen, you know. And of course... Back then, temples bridged the gap between earth and heaven. You see a lot of that in Enoch. Um, this is where your Tower of Babel story comes from. About 48 years later, um, the um, Cyrus the Great, he invades Babylon. He kicks butt on the Babylonians. And the... Uh, the sorry, I have a fly buzzing around in here. The... Um, the people who are imprisoned there, who are being, you know, the, this giant, almost like a slave army. He takes all of these people, some of which were from Israel, some of which weren't. I mean, the Babylonians, they captured people from all over. Cyrus the Great, he takes all these people and says, hey, I'm going to give you a new life in a new land. 
and you're going to get your own temple for your own religion. And all these people, not all of, but a bunch of these people, they, they all get carted off and sent to Jerusalem. Uh, he puts a man named uh, Zerubbabel, whose name means like a child of Babylon, uh, who claims to be a descendant of King David, though I don't know why any imprisoned Jew would name their son child of Babylon. This was this is a Babylonian aristocrat, you know. He's basically a puppet governor who rules in Jerusalem uh, for uh, Cyrus the Great of Persia, uh, who, by the way, Cyrus is named in the Old Testament as the Messiah. Uh, there's actually a scene where... Um, Somewhere, I think, around like Isaiah 40, 50, somewhere around there. Yahweh himself says, you are the Messiah. So this shows you how they how they felt, at least how this group of Jews felt about Persia, right. <laughs> who now owns them. And they take all, this, all these people and they put them in Jerusalem. And they're like, you rule Jerusalem now. You were in charge here. And then... The, the Persians pay to have a new temple built. And this makes the locals mad because from their point of view, and we have references to this in the Old Testament and throughout Enoch, they see a bunch of foreigners. And it actually says, uh, I forget where, uh, I, I can look it up later. They actually say in the Old Testament that a lot of these people that are coming from Babylon are not Jews. And they're being settled there. These are foreigners being settled in Jerusalem. And they're bringing all these foreign ideas and this strange religion. They call them uh, heretics. They call them apostate. They call them unclean. You know, and all these, all these horrible things. So obviously the people who are still in Jerusalem and the people who are coming from Babylon have two very different belief systems. Uh, at one point they... I think this is in Isaiah, but don't quote me on that. The, the locals say that the second temple is a harlot on a hilltop. Those exact words. It's a harlot on a hilltop. They, were, they did not like the second temple, how it was structured, what was done there, what it represented, anything about it. They didn't like the people who ran it. They claimed the people who, who ran it were, weren't even Jews. They, they claimed they were foreigners. And these are the people who we think of as Jews, as we think of this as Judaism, this this foreign apostate religion, okay? Based on this sect of type of Judaism, so to speak, they're right. saying these guys are not. Right, true. right. Okay. So we have, and one way to look at it is First Temple guys, you know, they were left behind when everyone else gets carted off. And then the descendants of those people, along with a bunch of others, come back to Jerusalem and they are basically put in power and sort of subjugate the local population. They have all the money behind them. They have the new temple. They control the theology. They have a whole new set of books. We actually have it written, I believe, in fourth Ezra that says Ezra drank a magic potion the same way that Zarathustra did, went into a trance, communed with God, who then dictated to him the entirety of the Old Testament. And then Ezra wrote it down while living in Persia and then took the books of the Old Testament and went to Jerusalem and gave them to the people. So Jewish tradition even preserves the idea that the Old Testament didn't come from Israel. It was an outside document, which is very strange. And mm. when you look at something like Enoch is full of this idea. These people came in, they kicked us out. They're doing strange things in the temple. They are apostate. They are unclean. They are oppressing us. You know, they have all of this money and these ideas, they eventually carry over into the new Testament because they, the, the second temple priests, they're always pictured as being these really wealthy people who live extravagant lifestyles. And you see this, this language throughout the book of Enoch that talks about how, you know, these wealthy people, they are traitors to the true Judaism. 
and they will not be rewarded. They, they will not go into heaven and all this other stuff. And then in the New Testament, what do we find? It is easier to pass a camel through the eye of the needle than for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom. We see this exact same thing throughout the New Testament. They, they have this victim identity. We are this oppressed people. Um, and you see this like uh, in the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the meek, you know, blessed are the poor, you know. And it, it's all about these people who are poor and downtrodden, but they'll eventually return to their rightful place and be victorious. Right. Right. And like every one of those things you see it in, uh, that they're actually quoting Enoch, all of that. They're actually quoting Enoch when they write that, uh, it's not just a similar idea. It's the same wording. Sounds uh, so cynic. It's very cynic in nature. The way that, yeah. They, yeah. They're looking at this, and, but yeah, and what it was, it, it's, um, classic, um, it's classic eschatological theology that is designed to be sold to poor people. You have these poor people. It's like, look, it's okay that you're poor. Eventually you'll get what you deserve. It, it's actually uh, being poor is uh, a blessing. And you actually see that, you know, not only throughout Enoch, but Paul in uh, second Corinthians, I believe, it's like, yeah, look, it is a blessing to be poor because eventually you will be blessed with all of these, you know, all this wealth and stuff in the afterlife. That could and, make sense of First Corinthians 9 when he's disputing with the Corinthians and he says something like, um, it, it sounds like he's a little upset, you know, some emotions coming through the pages. But he's like, uh, look, uh, so you're telling me, me and Barnabas, we can't get paid for our labor but the other 12 or the, the others, if you will, the other apostles, they can, yet we're the ones who labor to give you the gospel first. And then he gives the example for it is mm. written. And he quotes in, uh, a passage in the law where he says not to muzzle an ox yeah. while it threshes because it's supposed to eat while it works. And then he yeah. says, but does God care about animals? No, he's talking about us. And you know what's funny about that statement? In Enoch, you see very clear implications on how they interpret the animal laws and he mm -hmm. never references it in the literal sense like a pig in the literal sense is is unclean and that's it no they he he gives examples that the pig is an unclean person in mm -hmm. enoch it gives a reference of like how animals represent people and yeah. it's really strange because he's using the similar type of like is god really concerned with oxen not really he's talking about us so that sounds enochian as well in first corinthians 9 yeah uh, actually, uh, recently I was rereading the the first seven letters of Paul, and of course, you know, anytime I'm reading the Bible, I have a notebook and I'm taking notes. And every single page of notes, you can find the word Enoch somewhere in my own commentary. It's like, oh my God, you know, this references this certain passage in Enoch, and it's I I can't take notes on Paul without seeing Enoch. All it's like. Enoch's thumbprints are all over the letters of Paul. It's you need to ridiculous. do a commentary, an Enochian commentary on Paul. That's what I'd be an awesome title. It, dude. It's coming. It. It's coming. Good. Um, Good. And uh, the the reason is because I think that, and I, I, I told someone this, and it actually led to their complete deconversion. Um, if you take the New Testament and you rearrange the books and you put them in a more chronological order, because, I mean, there's no reason to put Matthew first. Uh, the reason you have Matthew there is because you want people to believe that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and all of this other stuff. You know, you start off with this nativity story and you move on all the way through. If you read the Bible that way, then everything you read after Matthew seems like it is um, just supporting material. It's there to prop up the Gospel of Matthew. And, you know, even something like Luke, which is actually an argument in a way, against. it's an argument against Matthew. Right. Um, when you read it, you're, you're seeing all these similarities to Matthew. And so in your head, you're thinking, oh, yeah, we have another. It, it's from a different point of view, but we have another account of what happened in Matthew. No, 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 no. Put it in chronological order. Read the Old Testament, 
or just listen to my show and I'll do it for you. Um, then read the book of Enoch. After that, go through the letters of Paul. You know, Thessalonians, Galatians, Corinthians, Philippians, Philemon, Romans. And then move on to James, uh, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation. And Jude. And Jude. Yeah. You read that in that order. Enoch and then the epistles. And you conclude it with Revelation. And you see something entirely different. The Bible at that point starts telling you that Jesus never existed. The Bible starts telling you that Jesus is this archetypal um uh, this archetypal character in line with Moses, Elijah, Melchizedek, Enoch, this heavenly intermediary who intercedes on our behalf for, you know, for, for our benefit. And he does this with the, the great high God, El Elyon, on the, the photo right behind me, the, the painting. Um, and so Enoch, you know, and Jesus, they both have the title, the son of man. You know, they were both called the chosen one or the elect one, you know, and let me they, take my myth vision thing down so people could see that. Picture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So th this is um, the ancient of days. One of the titles for the God El Elyon, that's Yahweh's father. Uh, it's a watercolor by Robert Blake. Um, that's cool. You know, uh, love the painting. It cost me like 30 bucks. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, you, you have the great high God, El Elyon, in your Bibles, if you read God Most High, that's what it's talking about. Uh, and th this is Yahweh's dad, or Jesus' dad. Yahweh and Jesus are the same thing. And, so you agree with Margaret Barker that he is, that Jesus technically plays this Yahweh theme in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah. And I, I believe that if, if you read the, the books in chronological order, uh, then I, I think the Bible is going to convince you of that. The Bible itself... I believe is mythicist. Uh, the I think the Bible itself, if you put it in chronological order and you understand the context, which means reading stuff like Enoch, uh, then you you will see quite clearly that early Christians, we're talking pre-gospel Christians, they believe that that this character, this was uh, this was Yahweh. This is the great angel of Israel. Uh, you know, their their patron deity. Uh, a revamped version of the Canaanite god Baal Hadad, and he he lives up in the seventh heaven with El Elyon. He's seated on a throne at his right hand, and he comes down in secret, which you see spelled out in the Ascension of Isaiah, and it's also mentioned throughout Enoch. This intermediary reveals himself. It's like in secret; he's hid. No one knows about him, and he comes down to the heavenly realm in disguise and he's not recognized by the powers that rule over the earth which are the demons uh, in in zoroastrianism and in enochic theology and also in paul evil rules earth good rules up in heaven and so everything above the firmament is ruled by el elyon and and the angels the firmament you know the the big glass dome that covers the earth and the air and everything else from there down is the earthly realm. And that's ruled by evil. This is a Zoroastrian concept that predates Judaism. And in there, and you see this spelled out explicitly in the Ascension of Isaiah and in slightly vaguer terms in Enoch, you know, uh, these, these powers, these earthly powers, it's, it's called earthly because it's the earthly realm. Uh, these are demons that live up in the sky. That's they thought demons lived. The idea that they lived all down in hell, no, they didn't. That was their punishment, was to later go down to a fiery pit, which is also spelled out in Enoch. And the Gospels give hint of that. Is it our time, they say? Right, you, right. You know, yeah. yeah, and so they, you know, for like centuries, the, the demons, they ruled up in, in the sky. And then this angel in disguise, the, the archangel Yahweh, um, uh, he comes down to the, the realm of the firmament below the first heaven and he's ambushed by him and they kill him. And the reason he's in disguise is because they know that if the, the favorite son of El 
is able to sacrifice himself, it will renew nature. It will renew the creation. And their whole thing, and this is another piece of Zoroastrianism, they they want to corrupt creation. That's their whole purpose. You know, they they do this in Genesis 6 and all throughout Enoch. And nature can be renewed, it can be purified and made perfect again only through this powerful blood sacrifice. Animals can do it a little bit, but sacrificing temporary, a temporary. god, yeah, you have right. to do it every year. And that's the whole atonement festival that they do at the beginning of October, um, which it plays a major role in uh, uh, Enochic theology and early Christianity. And so if you sacrifice this god, his blood can renew all of creation. That's why he has to be in disguise. The, angel, uh, the, the demons, they don't want to kill him. That, that'll mess up their plans. So he's in disguise. He comes in. And in, in um, the ascension of Isaiah, he's actually, he casts off his garments of immortality, that, that same transformation language and he puts on garments of flesh this idea of transformation philippians, philippians gives a hint of this yeah right right um and this actually goes back like five thousand years to an anana cult the the descent of anana where as she descends through the different layers she sheds her garments and becomes less and less divine and more and more mortal uh th this is ancient this this goes to back to the earliest days of civilization, you know, pre-literature. Like th this predates written record. You know, cuneiform wasn't invented yet. You know, th this is back when, you know, people had just learned agriculture. It's all tied into agriculture, uh, which is why there's so much agricultural imagery in the Gospels associated with Jesus. You know, fruit of the vine and all the stuff with bread, you know, this bread is my flesh. It, He's a grain god. He's Baal Hadad. Um, and so, mm. so this happens. And Dionysus in the Gospels and all these other... <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is good. Hey, by the way, this is good. I'm, I'm surprised uh, you're not caught fire right now and being punished <laughs> immediately. Right. <for> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't yeah. let it cover your ears. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that, that that's what this is. This is ancient, ancient mythology. That has just been repackaged over and over and over again, countless times throughout the Mediterranean world, throughout the entire world. You know, even like the Mayans had had fables like this, where you have this, these gods and you have to do these sacrifices to renew things because everyone thought that their kings, their health was directly tied into the health of the nation and the kings were deities and everything else. Uh, these are ancient ideas. This isn't anything new. Uh, the Jews and Christians, they didn't invent any of this. Uh, they just repackaged it. Uh, and they followed the, a tradition. They, they followed a, uh, you know, a practice that was popular at the time of taking these things and taking these, uh, these you know, cosmic myths and pretending they were about people. They would rewrite them as part of history. They weren't meant to be understood as something that really happened. It was, it was just, you know, a, a reboot, you know, to make it more relatable. Um, you know, it sounds it's like, like celestial combinations with, like, kind of you hemorrhizing or, uh, let me, yeah, I guess, kind of like. Um, uh, when we describe God in human terms, right? Mm -hmm. they, they give they give a lot of uh, attributes, human attributes to God. God is jealous. God is this. God is that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what humans are. You know, you got to go. Yeah. Why are the gods like that? Uh, is this uh, anthropomorphism? Is this you know what's yeah. going on? And is astro theology playing a role in this agricultural aspect? Yes, in some degree. Oh, absolutely. It is. Right. So Enoch, I suspect, because that's the focal point of this whole thing is Enoch, even though it goes into a lot of other things, like you said, it's how does tangled up. How does the temple thing we were talking about, you were drawing up to a conclusion, the wrong people are in charge, the wrong things happen with this temple. <clears throat> They're saying no, no, no to the second temple. There's <clears throat> a cult out there. And I see remnants of that in our New Testament today where oh, they're yeah. like temples coming down almost like they're not really there's no worries in fact they're like 
the whole thing needs to they come down. It. They wanted the second temple destroyed. Uh, the These sectarian Jews, these Jews who had been separated from the temple, they thought that the second temple was an abomination. They wanted it gone. They wanted it erased. Uh, you actually see it in Revelation where Christians are celebrating the destruction of the second temple. To them, it's a good thing. It, it's not this horrible thing, which is another reason why we shouldn't try to understand the New Testament in the context of the Old. The Old Testament is all about the second temple. And the New Testament, they wanted that abomination erased. They wanted it gone. They wanted it destroyed. They did not like the second temple. That's why there's a huge disconnect between Old Testament and New Testament. They they envisioned completely different temples. And what you had with, with uh, the, the culture that produced the writings like Enoch and what I believe uh, early Christianity is you had people who they did not like the second temple. They thought it was an abomination for those reasons you talked about in the very beginning of the episode. They believed that the role of the temple and you see this, there's an undertone throughout the book of Enoch. And you see bits and pieces of it, remnants of it in the Old Testament as well. They believed that the way this worked was the, the purpose of the Jerusalem temple. It, it was meant to essentially preserve the integrity of the world, of the universe. Uh, they talk repeatedly about how uh, the universe was sort of like spoken into existence. It was written into existence. It's almost like computer code. You know, El Elyon, he speaks the covenant. Don't don't think about the Ten Commandments. They didn't care about that at all. Neither did the early Christians. They they when they speak about the covenant, they're talking about the words of God that bind creation, that put the stars in motion along their prescribed courses, that outline the boundaries of the waters of the ocean and the rivers, you know, the stuff that describes the shape of the mountains and gives form to the universe. You know, in the beginning, the, everything is formless. It's all underwater. It's all chaotic. It's all dark. And what does El Elyon do? He begins speaking and his words change everything and you end up with this nice orderly creation and everything is how it should be and then genesis 6 these angels come down from heaven they breed with human women they create these abominable can, can we say giants. can we say gods came down from heaven can we use that phrase because i know a lot of we can call them angels don't get me wrong i mean it's ultimately the same thing i'm trying to say but yeah. i want to use that that word because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people use they believe that this is the cain line this is a line of human lineage the sons of god or the descendants of cain and they don't look at it in a divine sense they're more rationalist so they don't see sons of god coming down from heaven as being actual some type of superstitious aspect they want to right. say well this is a descendants of another tribe that in reality and oh no no like no the, the, these were not like oh some other people no 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 these were these it, it genesis 6 is quite clear these sons of el this is the great high god this is yahweh's dad he had a wife named asherah his sons some of them came down to earth and did things and it corrupted creation. And we actually, Enoch preserves multiple stories about how this happened. Uh, the Simiaza story is about uh, how he led a bunch of others down to earth and they had sex with human women. And that created a race of giants that were like 5,000 feet tall and they destroyed all kinds of stuff. And then the archangels had to come in and bind them all and throw them into a fiery pit in the desert and cover them up with rocks. And then they had to flood the whole world in more than a mile of water in order to kill all of these giants, the Nephilim. And that, that's one story. We also have the story of Azazel or Aziel, who uh, it was sort of like a Prometheus story. He and his angels, they brought a bunch of forbidden knowledge. This was heavenly knowledge, things humans were never meant to learn, things about astrology and spells, uh, seeing the future, uh, reading signs in thunder, uh, which is called brontomancy. Uh, 
cosmetics. Apparently, eyeliner is forbidden knowledge. I think uh, war. Wasn't war one of war, them? War, metallurgy, you know, all these different things. And he gives all of that. He basically kickstarts civilization. And this is all. It's not that. It's not necessarily that they weren't supposed to know these things. It's that it wasn't the correct time. It didn't come from the right source. It wasn't administered properly. There's a lot of this um, correct and incorrect wisdom uh, throughout Enoch. You know, El Elyon and his people are supposed to give you knowledge at the appropriate time. You know, not someone who ran off and did it prematurely, you know. So it's not necessarily it was the bad information it was improperly given and that's another think that's what happens to the temple i mean is this kind of what's going on here with we talked on the phone and i kind of want to re refresh your memory yeah yeah they're so, celebrating things at the wrong times yes doing yes. the wrong practices things like that and there's this omen so to speak saying oh no yes. destruction's coming yeah so the, the purpose of the temple is it's basically a capstone. If you remember in uh, Genesis 7, one of the sources for the floodwaters uh, in the Noah's flood story was underground. The water shot up from these fountains of the deep. And this is called the Tehom. This is the, the primordial water, the chaotic water that existed before creation. It has now been pushed down below the surface of the earth and a great stone plugs up the hole to seal it, and that protects the world. The problem is this seal is fragile, and it has to be maintained. And because of that, God has placed this temple on the stone, the, this capstone. It is the foundation of the temple. And these annual sacrifices done, this prevents the floodwaters from breaking through and flooding the world and destroying creation again. And part of the covenant is a prevention of the flood. And what's the first time you hear about a covenant in the Old Testament? At the end of the flood. It talks about this whole covenant, and then the flood is over. It will never happen again. And the temple is a physical embodiment of that covenant. This prevents the flood from destroying the nice orderly creation. And it requires this annual sacrifice, which is all tied in with divine kings and everything else. Well, <clears throat> the temple gets destroyed. That's problematic. These people, they need this temple. They need this carefully scheduled sacrifice to maintain the orderly creation. And they can't do it anymore because the temple's gone. And when a new temple is built, a different group of people is in charge of it. And what's even worse is these people, which came in from Babylon, they are using the wrong calendar. The Israelites, they had been using a solar calendar for centuries. We have Greek writers who talk about how the Jews were incredible astronomers. You could not get that idea from reading the Old Testament. They don't care about astronomy. They think it's blasphemy to look at the stars, okay? But here, they're, they're, they're talking about, you know, in, in like Enoch, they're talking about how crucial it is to maintain this nice, perfect, orderly calendar. It's so important. They wrote an entire book about it. It's the centerpiece in the book of Enoch. It, the first book of Enoch is made of, uh, of five books, and the central book, the centerpiece of it, is the book of astronomy. And it is a giant instruction manual on how to keep a perfect, orderly solar calendar. Let me Second get this straight. Use, use this a lunar straight. calendar, which is off by straight. 10 Let days a year. Straight. Real quick, real quick. So Enoch didn't live 365 years for real? <laughs> I have my doubts. Um, <laughs> so yeah, three hundred and sixty-five is a on a diet of some kind. I just don't know what it was. I'm um, trying to figure it out, bro. I'm trying. Yeah, to it was out. like I don't know. Sorry, I had seeds to and goat cheese or something. I don't know. But yeah, so we there's this giant instruction manual right in the middle of this like doomsday prophecy 
you know, uh, the, the, this giant collection of doomsday prophecy, right in the middle of it, is this whole thing on how to construct and maintain a proper solar calendar, which the, the Second Temple didn't use. They used the Babylonian lunar calendar, which meant that every so often they would just have to insert a bunch of days to get their calendar back in line. Otherwise, all of your festivals and all of your months would be coming in the wrong seasons because their calendar is like 354 days or something like that, the, the, the solar calendar. And the Book of Enoch, it actually begins uh, in the, the first part called the Book of Watchers. The, the opening chapters, before they even start talking about fallen angels, starts telling you about how it is so important to maintain a proper solar calendar. Because you need everything to be in the right order. You need your festivals to come at the right time. They keep stressing that. Your festivals have to be in the right time. I mean, for us, Easter shifts around by like five or six weeks, you know, and nobody cares. So what does it matter if a festival's at the wrong time? Their festivals had to come at the right time because they are what preserved creation. If their festivals came at the wrong time, it's literally the end of the world. And this is spelled out explicitly in the book of Enoch. Uh, my most recent episode, which dropped last month, goes through this entire idea start to finish. It is actually the most thorough treatment of this idea that you can find online. I don't mean to brag. I'm just saying you're not going to find a better source for it because... I Let looked plug, for a year and I couldn't find it. Yeah, we talked about this. Let me plug you real quick. Uh, for anyone watching, go down in the description. Guys, his links are there. Dragons in Genesis is his podcast. And he's going to help me get Myth Vision on podcasts as well. Because a lot of you guys can't watch YouTube technically to hear what we have. And I've got a lot of the material I'll be able to put out because we got plenty already on Myth Vision here. But we got more coming. And uh, I don't plan on stopping doing what I'm doing here. So... Uh, Jason's actually going to help me set up Myth Vision on podcast because I'm a I'm an idiot. I'm just going to keep it real. So uh, please continue with the end of the world because yeah, it's not that big of a deal, right? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so th this goes back to your ancient Canaanite nature renewal festivals. Um, they had this huge one uh, in which the uh, there was this big uh, harvest festival. A lot of the people from the city they would go outside, you know, into the countryside. They would build little tents to live in. So they wouldn't have to trek back and forth from the farms back into the city. They would live in these little temporary structures and they would, uh, they would bring in all this harvest and everything else. And uh, after they would go back in, you know, there would be this giant uh, re-enthronement festival for the king because the king is linked with their patron deity, which was Baal Haddad, uh, who was said to die, you know, uh, and then he would resurrect and all this other stuff. And so you'd have this whole uh, thing, sort of like the Zagmuk festival in uh, Babylon, where the king would, you know, there'd be like almost like a giant play. And the king would die, and then the king would be resurrected, and he would get, you know, brand new clothes and a new crown and a new scepter and all the rest, uh, and then be re enthroned, you know, um, and sort of like a modern day passion play, only the king would be playing the role of Jesus. Um, and so you, you had that, and this was all tied in with it. This was just a, you know, a, a newer version of it. And it, pretty much every culture in, uh, in the Mediterranean world had a version of this. Uh, you can actually find this in like Scandinavian cultures. Uh, the origins of Santa Claus comes from this idea. I have another episode. I have a Christmas episode that goes into this whole thing. And so th this whole, you know, humiliation of the king and then he is sort of reinstated and all the rest, uh, this all plays a role in it. And you needed access to the temple and you needed to do it at the right time of year. And it, they have this calendar, which was extremely important, an entire book written about this calendar and their main character, Enoch lives 365 years, the same amount of days as this calendar. If he was a second temple guy, it would have been 354 years. And so they, they have this whole thing 
in order to keep track of the year so their festivals align, you know, with, with the the celestial events. Because heaven and earth are they're in a connect the things that are happening on earth are a sort of reflection of what's going on up in the heavens. And this language is throughout the book of Enoch. Kings were angels and they were stars. Okay. They're they're kings, angels, stars, they're one thing. And so when you see imagery about a falling star, they're talking about a disgraced king. They're talking about an angel that was cast down from heaven. This is where your idea of Lucifer comes from. Those stories in the Bible that talk about Lucifer, they're talking about uh, the king of Tyre and uh, a king from uh, Assyria, I believe. Uh, if you actually read them in context, they're talking about kings. But you're not supposed to draw a distinction between a king and an angel because there is no distinction. They are the same thing. Anyway, the temple bridges that gap between earth and heaven, and they don't have access to it. So they can't replicate what is supposed to happen in heaven. And if they can't, then maybe what happens in heaven won't happen. And if it doesn't happen, that could mess up the whole world. And that's the reason the calendar is so important. And the way that they marked the beginning of this atonement festival, which was the most important festival of the year, this is their, their fall harvest festival. The way that they, they marked this was through the appearance of a certain constellation, the Pleiades, these seven bright stars. They appear, according to their own calendar in the, the book of astronomy, they appear at the time when they celebrate this great harvest festival. Uh, and th this is your nature renewal festival. This is what makes sure that the world won't die in winter. You know, the days are starting to get shorter. You're bringing in the food. You're hoping that this food is going to be enough for your civilization until your spring harvest, you know. And you, so you, you have this big thing. And this is sort of a promise to the people of the land. Look, it's okay. We're going to make it. You know, we did the festival right. We're not going to die in the darkness of winter this year. Every ancient culture that lives, you know, outside of the tropics has to deal with this problem, you know, a food shortage in the winter. And this is how they assured the people. This is how they assured themselves that they would live. And in their minds, the, the, the safety of the world was connected to this. And that's why you have to do it at the right time. They don't have access to their calendar. They don't have access to their temple. They can't do it. And when the stars come up in the sky, these seven stars, the Pleiades, they're operating on a lunar calendar now. These stars are showing up in the wrong month because the, the, the right month you know, gets there according to their calendar, and they have different constellations in the sky. You see this in the very beginning of One Enoch. They start talking about stars that transgressed their appointed order, and that's when creation gets corrupted. They're telling you that the author of Enoch is telling you that everything was fine until they switched to a lunar calendar. This now, sounds like the apocalypse of John in a lot of ways, and it and I don't know, and I want to ask you, but I don't want to get lost there because you're getting to some meat and I, I don't want to get you stumbled here, but I do have questions. And one of them is the, the Magi seeking mm -hmm. out, you know, the star, if mm -hmm. you will, being Christ born, etc. cetera. Uh, I suspect nobody knew to follow these wise men who were watching the correct constellations, mm -hmm. finding the correct Messiah, so to speak. Uh, has a lot to do with this Enochian celestial calendar concept stuff. I mean, yep, because you know. Jesus is a king, which means he is linked with angels, which means he is a star. And that's that's why, you know, um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that that's where all of this imagery comes from. I mean, it obviously can't be literal because people in the east look to the east and followed a star further east and somehow went west. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm pretty good at navigation. 
And if you're facing east and you start walking east and you just keep walking east, you're eventually going to have to swim to go west. I think they're trying to hint at lunar because, but, or, or the sun setting in the west, but yeah. Yeah. And and what it is they're they're, they're not actually talking about travel. They're talking about these stars appearing in the Eastern sky and the, they don't physically lead you anywhere. They lead you to believe, Oh, this is a sign. This star is telling us this thing happened and we read signs from the sky. And now we go to this place that the stars told us about. And that's where we find the earthly version of that star. You know, we find, the son of El Elyon here on earth. He came down as a star. Uh, and you, you actually see this throughout the book of Enoch. Uh, they basically tell you that these seven stars, the Pleiades, uh, that came out at the wrong time, they tell you that seven stars, seven angels, they actually tell you seven stars, and then they call them angels, came out at the wrong time. And were thus cast down for transgressing their schedule, and they were then thrown down to earth. Uh, now I'm I'm getting into some stuff that you're not going to find peer-reviewed literature on. So when I'm talking about how the the myths of Simahaza and Azazel and stuff like that are based on this idea that the the Pleiades you know, coming out at the wrong time due to this lunar calendar uh, is the origin of the fallen star thing. That is my own hypothesis. I spell this out quite clearly in my most recent episode of the podcast. And twice in that episode, I tell you, you're not going to find anything about this online because no one's writing about it. It's just my hypothesis. I think I can defend it quite well. I think I very thorough in explaining it in that episode. But if you don't find anything about it, don't be surprised. You're not going to. And if you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine because I'm just a guy who had this idea. But I quote the portions in Enoch extensively in that episode where they are, I feel, clearly trying to tell you that this is the meaning behind it. Um, so I, I just want to put that out there because at this point, when I'm talking about the, the fallen angels being this specific constellation, uh, and how that specifically ties in with the, uh, atonement festival, that's not based on previous scholarship. Um, the, the, uh, first temple atonement festival and end of the world stuff, you can find that, uh, uh, Margaret Barker in her books, uh, Temple Theology, The Lost Prophet, and uh, I can't remember the other one because that book gave me headaches and I've tried to suppress the memory. The Older Testament. Those three books talk about this idea extensively. I just take that a step further by linking it with these specific stars. And I believe that the text is that link. Uh, And I, I present my case in my latest episode of uh, the dragons of Genesis podcast. Go check it out. Yeah. So so I knocked you off your path though. Don't, don't just take my word for it. It's just my own hypothesis, but you know, so if, if you find like, if Dr. Bob comes on like next week and says, Oh yeah, that Jason guy, he's full of crap about the play at ease. Listen to him. Okay. Um, actually he might he's pretty open-minded man i think he might uh he might actually take into consideration what you're saying here and say oh never thought about that in fact we're going to be having you on with him we've already talked about that so yeah i'll um, yeah I, i'm i'll probably just turn into a big fanboy and then have a heart attack if that happens so that's dude don't worry listen i have powers that i can't tell the audience you know I pray, Father, that you do not show them these things and only reveal this to babes. But if you die on the show, you don't have to worry about it, bro. I've got what it takes to bring you back. But uh, if you, I can do that. We'll talk about that later. But, um, All right. I get to put on my garments of immortality. Yes. It's gonna yeah. rock. They, they think I'm just flesh. But um, 
I want you to get back on topic. This I threw you off, and I knew it was going to happen. This I didn't want this to happen. Yeah, it's, it's easy to happen with it me. It always this. happens. But you always find your way back. I don't know how. You, you're like the prodigal son who goes off the path and just finds his yeah, way back. Yeah. The stars. The stars connecting to the temple. What's about to happen? The New Testament's like, get ready, get ready, get yes. ready, get ready, get ready. It's about to happen. What's about to happen, dude? What's this about to happen? This is throughout Enoch from the first five or six chapters, which is – most people skip over it because it's kind of just a prequel. It's kind of stage setting for the exciting fallen angels all the way up to the very end of it. They keep talking about how your stars need to be right. Your festivals need to be right. And if not, the whole world is going to be destroyed again. And this is where it kind of starts touching on to Zoroastrianism again. Uh, you, you need to understand Zoroastrianism in order to understand the Old Testament Enoch and the New Testament and eschatology, um, maybe or some. They invented it. You you can't understand eschatology without touching Zoroastrianism. Uh, there's a fantastic podcast you you need to check out. Uh, it's called Blurry Photos. They deal with all kind of weird stuff that people believe. And way way in the beginning of their show, like seven or eight years ago, like episode like fourteen or so, they have a whole like a big two part episode about the the apocalypse about the end of the world and they hit zoroastrianism heavy and then i believe it was early last year i got to go on the show to talk all about zoroastrianism so i think it's like episode 217 or 227 one of those go get on your podcast app find blurry photos and just scroll back to the early 200s episodes and find the one where it says dragons and Genesis and Zoroastrianism. We're going to have it's, to do one on it. Yeah. It's like two hours watch long. It there. You're going to watch it yeah. here. You're going to go to his channel and watch it, but we're going to so, get you on yeah, this topic. Check that out. That's where your messianic movement comes in. You're into the world, you know, monotheism, the idea that all of your lesser deities just get renamed as angels. And so you have just one high God and then you have a bunch of angels uh, and, you know, which is why they're called angels and not gods in the Old Testament. Uh, and it's also where your idea of this great cosmic evil of Satan comes from, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I was on uh, with a guy named John Hammond on the Daily Atheist Morning Show, I believe, two weeks ago, talking all about Satan. Uh, so go and check that out. Um, anyway, so the end. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got to go. Bye. Um, no, no, no. I mean, oh, the okay, end, stop. the end, the, you know, stars, yeah, yeah. temple, what's so, about to happen. The yeah. end. Got off track again. So <laughs> the prodigal son now returns. So you have to do everything right. Keep these sacrifices, you know, going every year at the right time to coincide with their celestial events up in heaven to maintain the nice orderly creation. Otherwise, the events of Genesis 7, when the capstone popped out and the well springs of the earth shot the waters of the Tay home up into the air and the entire world flooded under 15 cubits of water, which that means Noah's flood was 22 feet deep. Um, I, I'm pretty sure over here in Charlotte at like 500 foot elevation, I think I'll be all right. Um, yeah. So yeah. that, that happens. And if, if you don't maintain this, proper schedule if you don't maintain this uh orderly arrangement with your calendar it's going to happen again and they are they keep repeating this over and over and over throughout all five books of one enoch the world is going to end if you don't get back on track get your calendar in order obey the order of the stars and everything will be all right if not and then it starts going into the story of Noah, but it does something interesting. Not only does the, the book of Enoch sort of transcend heaven and earth, and it's like you have things taking place in heaven and they have their parallels on earth because you're, you're meant to understand them as like two sides of the same coin. It's like shadow puppets, you know, the shadow on the wall is the hand, you know? And so what's happening in the heavens is happening on earth, you know, it, they're connected. They're the same thing. 
just being played out to a, a lesser degree. And you see this popping up again. And they do this again with time. The flood of Noah and the coming river of fire that will destroy the entire world and purge the creation, they are essentially the same event. It's just they're separated by time, the same way that heaven and earth are, you know, playing out the same way. These two events, the flood of water and the flood of fire, they, they speak about them as if they are the same thing because they'll be talking about Noah's flood. And while they're talking about this in the same sentence, they're like, you know, and this is what is happening. This is what is about to happen. And it's like, wait, I thought you're talking about something that happened later, you know, but you're talking about something that is in the past, but it'll be in the future. You're not meant to understand it as two events. These are, it's one event. It is the purification of the universe because these angels, these stars that came out at the wrong time, it corrupted everything. The switching to a lunar calendar, it messed it up. The apostate temple, the harlot on the hilltop ruined everything. And if we don't get it right, the flood will happen again. This time it'll be fire. It'll destroy the entire world. The righteous will go to heaven. The unrighteous, they go down below. They get thrown into the fiery pit with Aziel and Simahaza and all the rest of them. And they, they get either destroyed or punished forever, depending on which passage you read. Uh, and it says the same thing in the New Testament. Uh, most passages, you get destroyed. There's this eternal burning fire and it'll destroy your soul like annihilation in, yeah but in oh, i'm trying to remember i think there's a passage in matthew uh I, I quoted someone the other day uh it actually says that it is eternal torment and so it you you have this um you know the, this this idea which comes from zoroastrianism uh and even the whole idea of you know the, the righteous uh, and uh, the sinners being separated into two groups in the afterlife, that also comes from Zoroastrianism. That, that's not a Jewish idea. Uh, so, so I yeah, want to ask what's coming. Uh, fire is coming because we have the wrong, because we're using a lunar calendar. Don't lose track of this. We got to remember, like okay. our audience has to help us remember this because this gets deep guys. You can tell there's a lot of layers to this and he's got a lot of information it's easy to get off track. So two things back to the Kings being connected to stars, heaven, stars, Kings, mm -hmm. earth. They're connected. They also are the same thing, so to speak. Um, yeah. It's almost like this though. And I wanted to ask you this. You don't have to go off into a tangent necessarily to explain probably on this one, but um, the idea, for example, I wrestled with the Prince of Persia and Daniel. Mm -hmm. All right. Is this he's he's wrestling with just an angelic being or is there something in Persia like a, a manifest like a, a king there's an issue with or something going on there? So technically, do these these angels or these these demons, these fallen gods, whatever you like to call them, gods, are they connected to a person? Almost like people talk about you have a guardian angel, so to speak. Uh, there's a connection in their in their mythology or in their in their theology where. You are of your father, the devil. He's a liar from the beginning. Does that mean that they're connected to this heavenly being or this demonic being, yeah. earthly being, really? Because you point out the demons are earthly. Yeah. Demons are of the earthly realm. Angels are of the heavenly realm. So technically, the children of God are born from above. And those who are not are earthly, so to speak. They're carnal minded. They're earthly minded. They're of their father, the devil, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you get that language throughout the writings of Paul as well. You know, so you want to be of you know, purity and of, of heaven, not, you know, of earth. Yeah. I want to ask you a question poking a little, why not just rationalize and say, when Jesus was saying you have your father, the devil, he's just saying you are uh, the devil. There's no metaphysical being in their theology. Is that wrong? I mean, they have a real spiritual world beyond what, what's right. Mm. What rationalists will argue. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I think that these, this idea of, you know, the, the, the people and the, the the kings and the angels and stuff I, I do think 
you know, and the, the guardian angels, uh, which guardian angels also come from Zoroastrianism. Uh, I don't think you're supposed to think of these things as being separate, that they're, you know, like the, these are interconnected ideas. Um, and so like, if you have, um, you know, if, if you have the actions of an angel, those are th also the actions of a king, you know, vice versa. The, the king is an angel, which is also mm -hmm. a star. Uh, my girlfriend hates it when I say that because it gives her a headache. Um, and yeah, so when they're saying, oh, yeah, you know, you are of this thing. They're not. I don't think they're trying to make some kind of distinction saying, oh, well, you know, you are of, you know, these demons but you're not actually one of those demons. I don't think they're trying to make a distinction. I think they're saying like, yeah, you, you're full of demons. You know, you're, you're not you know, you, you are not one of these heavenly beings. You are, you know, one of these, you know, the, these uh, material world forces. You're one of these evil spirits, you know? Um, I mean, you have it all over in the, uh, in the New Testament, where uh, like Paul is talking about how the Christians are becoming sons of God, you know, he's like, you will become sons of God. You know, he, he's talking about an angelic transformation here. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people are angels. We are just in flesh right now. And as they say, you will cast off your garments of flesh and put on garments of immortality. The same way that Enoch does uh, in the end of uh, the book of parables. He, his skin melts off, it burns away, and then he becomes this angelic thing, you know? And th okay. this is, and they actually, uh, they even talk about this. Um, you see it again in Enoch and again in Paul. You're probably getting sick of me saying that, no, but... but uh, you see this numerous times where they, when one of these faithful people dies, they don't say, oh, you know, Joe Bob from next door, he was a really good Christian and he died. No, they say he fell asleep because in their mind, there is no death. If you're one of these good people, you don't actually die. You go to sleep, they bury you in the ground and then you will transform, you know, At on the, the day end. of judgment right. into this angelic being, you will awaken and you will fly up into the heavens. You know, and they use this language throughout Enoch and throughout the, the writings of Paul. You know, they did not, they don't say they died. They say, oh, you know, and some of our brothers fell asleep. They're saying, oh yeah, they died, but they're coming back. Because they have this whole idea of the resurrection of the dead, One which more again thing. is all over Enoch. I got to get you back on a different track here because this gets oh, okay. closer to the topic you're on, but this is good. Um, fire, water, obvious judgment scenarios. And everyone talks about, well, the earth was flooded, but you'll never flood it with water again. You know, Christians typically understand mm -hmm. this, but one day by fire. And we know second Peter talks about the elements melting with fervent heat. I'm not going into an interpretation from full preterism here on that being the temple itself in which they believe that is the judgment is the temple itself, but nothing beyond that. It's literally just the temple itself. That is the final judgment, according to full preterist. Um, when you look at, and I asked Dr. Price this, when you look at Sodom and Gomorrah and you look mm -hmm. at, at, at the flood in Noah, mm -hmm. he says, it appears that lot and his family thought that the end really happened. <laughs> And this is why he's sleeping with his own daughters in this situation. Yeah, they traveling. thought everyone else on earth was dead. Right. They thought this is the end. According to the narrative here, it's fire. You're yeah. saying in the flood, there's a simultaneous water and fire, if you will, uh, the judgment here. Or what do you say? Sort of. So they're what they're doing. And it, it's this, it's this fantastic literary device. They are, they are telling the story of, the coming destruction of the world through fire by reminding you of the story of the past destruction of the water of, of the, the world through water. So they're, they're using one thing that you understand to explain another thing that you don't and sort of linking the two by speaking about them as if they are sort of the same event. Um, and you, you see this like, Enoch in the story, he sort of exists outside of time. 
you know, he's seeing the past, he's seeing the future, you know, he's seeing the present, he sees the full, you know, breadth of the earth, he sees all of the heavens, you know, stuff like that, okay? And so he's sort of seeing things simultaneously. He's seeing, you know, in, and from his point of view, it's pre-flood, he's seeing the coming flood of the world and then the coming destruction at the end of time, and he's sort of talking about them at the same time. So you're meant to see a connection between the two. But at the same time, you're understanding, okay, one of these happened in the past, one will happen in the future, but they are sort of the same thing and they're happening for the same reason. And that is um, something that you don't really see uh, much in the Old Testament. And that is the remission of sin. Uh, the, the Old Testament struggles with the idea of the remission of sin. How do you get rid of sin? Oh, well, maybe you kill a chicken or no, it's a goat. And no, no, it's, it's, it's a lamb and no, it's, it's a cow. Um, uh, you know, maybe you wash yourself. Maybe you do this. Maybe you can't, maybe someone does it for you. And they're, they're going back and forth on this, you know? Um, uh, and in Enoch, it, it's very simple. You have this one giant blood sacrifice. It happens inside the temple. Blood is splashed all around. And since the temple represents the world, the blood of the atonement sacrifice cleanses the entire world for that year. And th that's how the remission of sin is done. And twice in history, you have it done you know, by heaven on a cosmic scale. The first time, uh, to, to get rid of the Nephilim, the, the mile high giants from the, the fallen angels. And that that's Noah's flood. And the second time is at the end of time to basically get done with everything. And when that happens, it won't just destroy the earth. It will also destroy heaven, hmm. which is another breakaway from the old Testament. If you said that heaven would be destroyed, the Jews would probably have you crucified, but they're in Enoch. And in the New Testament, what, what do you have Jesus saying? He says that heaven and earth will pass, and then we'll get a new heaven and earth. He's quoting Enoch when he says that. Heaven and earth both get destroyed, and a new heaven gets rebuilt after the, the great lake of fire. And the reason that they have two different things, you know, first it happens with water, and then later it happens with fire— is because, you know, at the end of the flood story, you know, oh, I, I promise that I'll never do this again. That this is part of old Mesopotamian mythology dating back to the flood of Shurapak. Uh, I covered that in like episode six or seven. You know, th this is the flooding of a city and their gods promise to never go and do that again. And that's why you have this promise that shows up in the story of Noah. It, it comes from the story of Utnapishtim and Zeusudra and Atrahasis. But they have this thing, oh, it'll never happen by water again. And then they get influenced by the Persians, by Zoroastrianism. And what does their eschatology say? The end of the world will come by fire. So they, it's, it's brilliant. They don't have to worry about any sort of contradiction. It's like the one time in their history they don't have to worry about contradicting themselves. They're like, oh, look. It's not going to happen by water again. It'll happen by fire. And, and so quick thing, yeah. quick thing. This is, I got to jab it in there, man. Thanks alpha for the two uh, euros here. Is Satanism a good religion? Do you have a quick uh, stance on that? Um, I normally don't I get more of a philosophy. Topics. Um, and uh, Satanism isn't really one unified thing. You have some people who believe in a literal Satan, uh, in which case I would have about the same opinion of that as of any other religion. Um, <laughs> you're, you're trying to use a mythology to govern your life, but then you also have uh, like the, the, the satanic temple, which is basically just atheist activists who use, um, you know, who basically shine a light on the, the difficulties of blurring the line between church and state. Um, and hey, if, if you want to find a way to keep other people's religion from influencing my life, more power to you. So that, you. that would be my answer there. So now on fire, water, I, I, I got to ask this um, because there's so much here. 
in terms of their, they're thinking there's an end about to come. Uh, it's all related to the fact that they think this temple's corrupted. They're doing mm-hmm. things at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And because the temple is about to be gone or they're hoping it's going to be gone. And they probably mm-hmm. been hoping that for centuries, this isn't mm-hmm. a new innovation in the first century. Like people go, well, in the thirties, then this guy came out of nowhere and just said, the temple's coming down soon. As if there was real literal predictions just by this one guy, Jesus, it appears that for centuries, there's been a movement of Jewish people or some type of Israelites who are saying down with this thing. They're wrong yeah. since the bat or since Persians, allow the reconstruction and all the stuff's going on. So it's been going on for a while and they were yeah. influenced by Zoroastrianism and stuff. So the end that's pictured is the temple coming down and the earth is going to, obviously the earth and the heavens have to be reset completely yeah. because there's no way that temple can be destroyed again. And the earth and heaven, how's that work? If this temple comes down, the end is really going to come. I don't get it. Cause I know that the temple been destroyed before and you know, nothing right. literally happened so what so the you know and you know these these ideas um uh, they they didn't have they they probably didn't have these exact ideas when the first temple was destroyed and we kind of get into some weird things with the timeline because when we talk about first temple and second temple you know we talk about you know pre-babylonian exile and post the problem is we don't know exactly when all of this happened. I mean, we we know when the Babylonian exile was, but the the theological shift may have actually happened later. The when they may not have had these eschatological ideas at the time. They actually probably didn't. When the temple gets destroyed and then this new temple gets built, that was probably your what we would now call our first temple period the the jerusalem temple constructed by the persians is probably what the old testament is referring to when it talks about solomon's temple hmm. you know that grand idea it seems to be taking details from uh, i believe assyrian writings um but it seems that that idea of this great grand temple that has always been may have actually kind of started with this new Persian temple. And of course they did what they always do. They backdated it. They pretended that that was happening centuries and centuries ago. There's no evidence of that. We've never found any site that we could even call Solomon's temple. Um, But the, this, this Persian idea, I mean, this uh, Enochian idea, is it really their temple destruction? in 586 BC, it is them being ejected from this uh, this Persian-built temple, which I believe is why you actually see more Zoroastrian ideas in Enochic theology than in Second Temple theology in, in the Old Testament, that there was a lot of Persian influence, a lot of Zoroastrian influence in this temple that was constructed after 540 BC in Jerusalem. And this group of priests was running the show. And another group kicked them out a century or two later. And because of that, now they had these problems. And like everyone else, they backdated it to the destruction of, you know, Jerusalem in 586 by the Babylonians. Uh, and it's so Christ hard to get our timelines right because right. these people, they destroyed so much of their own history. They rewrote so much of their own history and they're constantly arguing against other people and even themselves. And so, and also we, we have to remember that after the, um, the collapse of the bronze age, Writing kind of went away for a while, so the entire history is it, it, it's a dark age, you know, and so we're we're trying to piece things together, and that's why the dating of these things is so difficult. I know Dr. Price mentions the Pharisees and that the term being Parsis, which meant uh, Persians, pretty much. Right. It, it it may have been almost like a slur against. You know, oh yeah, you're you're not you're not a real Jew. You know, you're you're a Parsi. You're you're a Persian, and that's where the term Pharisee came from. 
Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, there, there are all sorts of things like that. Um, I mean, both your your groups that contributed to the Old Testament and those that contributed to Enochic literature, uh, they were both heavily influenced by Zoroastrianism. Uh, I mean, that, that has been demonstrated numerous times by countless people. Uh, I mean, there are Jewish scholars who are like, yeah, the Persians pretty much invented Second Temple theology. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's that's not even... Uh, you know, a controversial topic. I mean, that's, that's consensus. At that's this pretty, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I got one last question for you okay. in light of, cause I definitely need to go back, reread Enoch and try to connect these dots, like you said. And before we get to ending on this question, if you're watching and you weren't on earlier, go in the description, all the links are down there. Everything's down there. I talked about the beginning of this video. I want to try and go and visit Dr. Carrier sometime but that's going to take funding at some point um no rush right now especially during everything that's going on but i want to go do recordings with him just like i did with dr price in person great quality get 60 to 100 videos out of him and you guys have plenty to chew on and by the way i want to answer your question or i want to have your questions answered by him so I'm going to be getting questions from you. If we can make that happen, that'll be a GoFundMe some point down the road where I could fly in person, interview him for multiple days, create an enemy because he's going to hate me by the time I get done, you know, <laughs> dragging these questions on with him and getting them recorded. But at least you guys will love me for that. And then uh, so now to the to the point, check out his podcast, Dragons in Genesis. So question, Jason. Did they think this was the literal end of the literal world in the literal sense? Or do you think these guys all thought of this as apocalyptic language? And let me finish by saying this. There are people who say, if you look in your Hebrew scriptures or the, the Old Testament, when he went to go destroy the judgment of Babylon or there were judgments on Israel, or there were judgments on Persia, or whatever it may be, it sounds like the earth and the heaven are going to crack and the earth is going to catch fire and the stars are not going to give their light anymore. And they go, calm down, calm down. This is just apocalyptic language. It's not literal, and therefore it's not really to be believed. Dr. Price said, I really need to read a book where the guy goes to make the case that they really thought the end was actually going to come, but it wasn't the end that actually came. It was just the destruction of these places, et cetera, et cetera. Full Preterist, which is the vein I came from, say, no, 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 it's apocalyptic language. It's just allegorical. It, it, it's exaggerated language of something that's happening. And they believe the New Testament is doing the same thing with the temple in 70 AD. And that therefore the extreme elements melting with fervent heat and all this, the, the scrolls of heaven roll up and the stars will not give their light. Eh, calm down. It was just the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Not the literal end of the world because the destruction of the temple is the microcosm of the macrocosm, which is the universe. So technically heaven and earth being connected to a covenant or connected to a temple ends in a new temple or a new heaven and new earth the body of christ more platonic so to speak or heavenly in nature is what they would try to if you would argue what are your thoughts about that sorry if that was too much but no no that that that's perfect um so w when it comes to enochic theology um the qumran sect early christianity and when i say early christianity i mean like um the time of Paul, not not the, the later Gospels, you know, so uh, up to about like 50, 60 AD, thereabouts. <clears throat> um, I believe that they did indeed think that the world was literally about to end. Uh, and I believe this for several reasons. Uh, when you read other apocalyptic literature, such as Daniel, uh, you have these prophecies concerning when the end of the world will, will occur. And these people, I mean, they were all into calendars. They kept track of stuff and they calculated it. And it's like, oh, you know, a certain amount of Jubilee years, you know, and all the rest. And so they had actually calculated it going from the destruction of the, the temple or the, I'm sorry, the, the building of the new apostate temple up to, you know, th this when they thought the, the world was actually going to end, you know, and when this Messiah would appear uh which again comes from zoroastrianism this is uh in there it's called the seo shiant it's like the uh the rebirth of zarathustra which 
in their thing, he um, Zarathustra basically swam in a lake and left some DNA behind, to put it gently. And then this DNA would then be used uh, up in heaven to build a new Zarathustra called the Seo Shiant, who would come at the end of time to judge the living and the dead, yada, yada, yada. Okay. And we have this same thing where Paul says that the sperm of David was preserved and used to construct Christ, you know, who was going to come and all the rest. And so this exact same thing is they're, they're anticipating this. Okay. And you, you have this like in the prophecy of Daniel, um, and they calculated it. They wrote about it. They said, it is going to happen at this certain time. And they were anticipating this and they had, because they didn't know exactly when, you know, like the, the starting dates for this second temple period, their, their calculations kind of varied a bit between 30 and 70 AD. And so they were looking forward to this. And we, we have numerous writings concerning this. They were anticipating this. They were expecting this. They were hoping for this. And they believed it was going to happen, you know, either around 30 AD or around 70 AD, somewhere around in that time frame. And you get you get an impression of this in the writings of Paul. He's like, yeah, Jesus came recently. His whole thing happened up in the sky. He, you know, he showed up, he died, he was resurrected. Then he started appearing to people like Peter and James and the other apostles. And then finally to me, and that started the clock. And now we are living in the end times. Everything is about to go to hell in the handbasket. We're all about to die. And you can see this quite clearly in the writings of Paul. He anticipated that, you know, this is the, this is it. We are the last generation, you know? And so I believe that they did indeed take this literally. They were expecting that this would happen. They calculated when it would happen. Um, there was even a guy, I cannot remember his name, but he actually wrote about how, um, this one group of apocalyptic Jews uh, may have actually been trying to kickstart an apocalypse by assassinating Romans, uh, a group called the Sicarii. These were you know, sort of like Assassin's Creed. It was these, these Jewish uh, assassins. They would carry hidden blades. And whenever there'd be like some big, you know, crowd of people, they would sneak up shank a guy a whole bunch of times and then run off and blend in with the crowd and be like, oh my God, this dude just got murdered and then slip away. Um, they actually think that's where the name uh, Iscariot comes from mm -hmm. for, for Judas. Um, his name basically means either Jew the betrayer or Jew the assassin. Uh, unlikely names for a real person. Uh, but they think that some of these apocalyptic Jews may have actually been deliberately killing Romans thinking that this great war, which they talk about in Enoch, with the Romans, which they talk about in Enoch, would bring about, it would basically be the end of the world. Um, and so I think they they very much did take it literally. They actually believed it would happen. And I think writings like Mark is sort of a way of saying, well, maybe it did happen, just not the way we thought it would happen. Exactly the same way that Harold Camping did, like, what, 2011, when he talked about, oh, you know, on, like, was it like May 21st or whatever, the rapture's going to happen, people are going to fly out of their cars and go up into heaven, you know, we're going to have all these job openings all of a sudden, and then in October, uh, oh, October pops up again for the end of the world. Um, all of a sudden in October, the actual end of the world is going to happen. And then when nothing happened, I mean, people were like, people literally believe this. They were, you know, selling off their kids college fund to buy billboards, to proselytize to people up and down the interstate. Mm -hmm. And then nothing happened. Harold Camping canceled his radio show. He said, oh, it, it must have just been a spiritual judgment. And then no one heard anything more from him for the rest of his life. I think the Gospels were kind of like that. They were like, well, the end of the world came and went, and we kind of missed it. Maybe it happened, and we missed it, and we didn't notice it happening, and Jesus was hidden, 
the way Enoch is said to be hidden, you know, and interesting. Yeah, and so there's two. There's various it views in history, of history, and we didn't quite notice. But look, the temple did get destroyed, and the end time is coming, and we just don't know when. Oh, with you know, very soon, any day now, within a generation, some of you might still be alive. No one knows the day or the hour, a and day you is have like people a thousand years and today who are still saying. Oh, Look, look at all the crazy stuff in 2020. It's right. happening now. This is the end. There is no 2021. I think it's yeah. the same thinking that's been going on since about, I don't know, 240 BC. My, and that that is a good question because that's why I'm investigating this currently is ultimately, why is the church still waiting? This is the and this is a good question. To ask why are they waiting? Can they not read it? Right? It supposedly happened, or did it? Or yeah, or did it somewhat and it didn't really? So are there two conflicting concepts? Was there really an anticipation of the actual kingdom coming? Mm -hmm. And since it didn't, well, guys, you are the kingdom. What? I thought yeah. the kingdom's yeah. coming, but we, now I'm the kingdom. Like what yeah. co these concepts, these definitions, these terms, do they all mean the one thing? And so when you harmonize all of them, you can try and make one theological term fit this view. But Dr. Price and other critical scholars say, look, a failure happened. They spiritualized it. A failure happened. They spiritualized it. And it's like, yeah. if you don't see the failed prophecy taking place and then they try to make it happen in a way almost like the resurrection there's this like uh, heresy in the new testament by hymenaeus and philetus it's a quick little like excerpt like a sentence where he says don't go and fall for the hymenaeus and philetus error where they believed that the resurrection had already happened now mm -hmm. what's weird about that is when you go to because the church is still waiting on the resurrection the final resurrection here when you go to the gospel of thomas and they ask him when will be the repose of the dead the resurrection of the dead. When's that going to happen? And Jesus says, look around, man, you can't see it, but it already happened. Dude. Yeah. Is that really what the teaching of the new Testament is that this is not a bodily physical. There's something supposed to come. And is this why the church is still waiting? Cause they really see stuff that says, Hey, there's supposed to be something to come. So somewhat of that spiritually is here, but we're still waiting for something to come. Or is it all <laughs> one concept? It's all spiritual. You missed it. And, or it's covenantal and full preterist to write. This is Hebraic apocalyptic language. You guys are just missing it. You know what's going on, and that's yeah. why I ask these questions. Yeah, it's yeah. And see, I don't, I don't think that there is one message in the New Testament or in the Bible in general because it came from all these different groups of people who did not agree with, like, the author of Mark did not agree with any of the other gospel authors and the author of Mark did not agree with Paul. And, you know, uh, Luke argues against Matthew and no one even knows what John is doing. And, you know, uh, so I don't, I don't think there is one message. I think if you try to look for one, you're probably, you know, putting your own views into it. Uh, but I think this whole line of thinking, I, I think you see it quite clearly in Enoch. These people, they desperately wanted access to the temple and they didn't have it. And they thought that they needed this to maintain the orderly creation. And they talk about how they will one day sort of get it. And I think this carries on over into Christianity. They're like, well, we're never really going to get it. The temple is us. It becomes part of us. And this is actually a common idea uh, that goes back to the whole divine kingship thing. All these kings were considered sort of the earthly incarnation of their the, the national patron deity. But as these empires rose and fell and more and more people became vassal states of foreign empires, it was kind of hard to make that argument. It's like, oh yeah, you know, our king is the earthly incarnation of Baal Hadad, but we don't have a king because we're now owned by Egypt or Babylon or Assyria or Persia or Rome, you know, or the Seleucid. How, how are you going to to make that claim when you can't even have a king anymore? Um, and I think that what they were doing essentially was, you know, uh, sort of bringing it down from the, the royal level and making it more personal. And that's why. It's not this whole temple centric thing anymore. It because it, it becomes this personal, uh, you know, this personal savior mystery cult where 
you yourself are linked with the deity. You know, the, the temple lives within you. You are the church upon you. I shall build my temple and everything else instead of we need this giant temple and the king is going to be the high priest and he's going to rule everything. I think that's why you have this giant shift, why it went from... Um, this creation by combat thing where this God defeated a dragon and he's the king and everything else. And eventually became this thing of a much more toned down personal savior who comes in and he renews nature through this self-sacrifice because you had these downtrodden people who couldn't even govern their own lands anymore because for 80% of their history, they were ruled by some foreign power or another. Well, that's funny. I mean, revelation, chapter one and verse six and has appointed us a kingdom or as a kingdom or mm -hmm. kings, some translations say as kings and as priests serving his God and father to him be the glory. Anyway, my point is, is everybody becomes a king now, uh, you know, yeah. like, and what's funny is like, you have books like the old Testament, you have books like uh, Enoch, you have things like the new Testament and they just keep telling you the same thing over and over and over. And people keep trying to find some other meaning, you know? And it's like, sometimes maybe just take it literally. Maybe they kind of aren't for Kings anymore because they haven't had one in several centuries because they're always owned by someone else. And you are the temple and it's all a giant mystery cult. And you have this personal thing. I think that's what they're trying to tell you. And I, and the reason I think that is because they literally wrote exactly that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think it's just, you know, if you look at it in the historic context and you read some of the other literature that was important to them at the time, things that they were quoting from, um, and you put stuff in the correct order, I think it's a lot easier to understand. Of course, I could be completely wrong about all of this, um, you know, but that that's I just my interpretation that's the of spirit, it. That's the spirit to have. Yeah. This, I have the answer. I am true. Yeah. I have the, I know I'm the, dude, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. To me, that that becomes cultic, yeah. and uh, it, it is not scholarly. It's not it's not opening up for criticism. It's not opening yeah. up for dialogue. It's I'm on top of the mountain, looking down at everyone, saying, "I got the answer, and yeah. you don't have it." And so, we, listen to me. Yeah. We lost. We have lost so much. You know, th there's a culture that is you know been ruled by so many different people. They have had so many different theologies influence their their ideas. They have rewritten their own history countless times they have destroyed so much of their own documentation that in all likelihood unless there's some gigantic discovery of text that we have never seen before in all likelihood we will never get the answers so all of this is hypothetical it's just these are the best explanations we have at the moment but the next time a ugarit is discovered or a nag hammadi or a qumran it's all going to change again, and we're going to have new explanations, new ideas, new hypotheses. And so I'm not saying this is what it is. I'm saying this is my understanding. It's the thing that makes the most sense. I think it's a very good understanding, and my mind is probably going to change by next year because I will have read another book. I will have listened to another lecture. Some other discovery will have been made, you know. We don't know. We will likely never know the answer. And so I think we need to keep as many of these different hypotheses on the table as possible. If it has archaeological or textual support, we need to hang on to it. We don't need to dismiss it. I'm a mythicist, but we need to hang on to historicity until we find out, just in case. You know, because tomorrow we could find some guy from, you know, 31 A.D., providing an eyewitness account of some Yeshua ben Yosef getting himself crucified by the Romans. And we'd be like, ah. well, I've got more material for the podcast, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, and that's we good don't to know, have. And we will likely never know, which I think I, is fun. It, I love your spirit, more man. Questions. Everybody, you know, give a behind your screens, behind your phones, round of applause for, Jason, folks, I really appreciate you joining me today here on Myth Vision Podcast, man. I really did enjoy this. There was a lot of information, and we're going to be going into a lot more information. You know, there's yeah, there's just so much. This just touches the this is like the tip of the iceberg on Enoch. I'm currently in the middle of a giant 
it was supposed to be a mini series. It's gone on far too long, but I go through the entirety of the first book of Enoch, every chapter, every scene. Uh, I'm going to be finishing it up very soon. Uh, so if you've ever been curious about the book of Enoch, go check out my podcast. Uh, there's an episode called the order of things that talks about the problems with reading the new Testament in that order. The episode immediately after that goes into the book of Enoch, how it was discovered, how it was translated, everything else. And I go through the entire thing and then I'll be launching into its influence or possible influence. I want to make that clear possible influence on the writings of the new Testament. Um, and to find it, just get a podcast app of any kind search dragons in Genesis, which is right down here. Yeah. Your name search, yeah. search dragons in Genesis. You can't miss it. It's a big orange logo with Godzilla. Let me attacking share it. Jerusalem. Um, I'm going to share the, the only uh, one out there. Godzilla attacking Jerusalem on an orange background. Look for that. It says Dragons in Genesis. And um, yeah, just subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use. Let me uh, see if I can share this. Let me see if I can share it real quick. Hold on here. All right. Let me see what we got. Let's see. Application. Da, da, da. Um, let me just do entire screen. It never hurts to do an entire screen. So here we go. So here is Dragons in Genesis. Can you see that? There you go, people. It The logo is hard to miss. I designed it to grab your attention. You see a giant orange square with Godzilla attacking Jerusalem. That's me. I am the only <laughs> secular podcast with Godzilla on the logo. Um, That's awesome, dude. So you're coming so, to YouTube as well, right? You're going to be on yes, YouTube. Yes, I'm, I'm currently it? outlining a bunch of YouTube content. As soon as I get my camera set up, uh, straightened out, then I'll be recording some stuff for that. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, uh, I'll be... Uh, I actually technically have a YouTube channel. There's only one video. It was posted like, I don't know, four years ago or something. Um, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It's actually uh, about me seeing a flying saucer near um, Area 51. The video is so clear. You can see the duct tape on the flying saucer. It's amazing. Go check it out. Um, Dude, you're about to lose some viewers, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's... It, yeah, it's it's great. It's like hovering around behind my head. Um, yeah, it's 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 funny. <laughs> so that that's the only video I have. I put it up there several years ago because uh, I had no plans of actually starting a YouTube channel. So go check that out. Subscribe to it, even though the only thing it has is a fake UFO video. Uh, because <laughs> in the coming weeks or months, there will be uh, Bible mythology content coming to that channel i'm Good. gonna be going like brief overview of the bible going more in depth into some things outlines all sorts of stuff so Dude, there'll, there'll be a lot you, of man. content thank you thank you guys for all the positive feedback on jason here and thank you for the super chat that i got earlier um you guys are awesome man i really really do appreciate the fans who are on here who love this content who love learning new things and testing their thinking because that's gotta what love here, the community man. You got to, man. And uh, we're going to be having him on more. So if you guys have particular questions you're interested, you know, I always enjoy a little sh a shekel or two, but <laughs> we'll ask him, man. I don't care either way. You guys help me go and keep going. So thank you so much, man, once again for joining me. And don't thank forget. Thank you for having me. Don't ever forget. This is Dragons in Genesis, but we are Myth Vision. <laughs>